Hello, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning from Geneva, headquarters of the World Health Organization. Every Wednesday with you are our Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kirkova answering your questions about COVID-19. My name is Alexander Kuzmanovic from the Department of Communications, and I would invite all our viewers watching us on Twitter to use the hashtag AskWHO while asking questions. If you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube or LinkedIn, please leave your comments, uh, questions via comment section. Good afternoon, Maria, Mike, how are you? Thank you for finding the time this week again to answer the, the, the questions from our viewers, especially as we are marking this painful moment this week uh, where we passed um, one million lives lost directly to, to COVID-19 and millions other suffering either being affected by the virus or uh, for other health services being de disrupted. However, how do you see the way forward and how we can improve things? Well, Alex, thanks for having us again. And I think indeed we're at a really tragic milestone right now of at least one million deaths um, due to COVID-19. Um, and these are deaths that have occurred over the last nine months. Um, from a new virus that has entered the human population, spread across the globe. Um, and I think we need to take some pause and actually reflect on this. It's not just a number. Um, these are a million lives lost. These are families. These are mothers and fathers and children and friends and loved ones. And um, I think all of us know people who are either directly or indirectly affected by this pandemic. Our, all of our lives are affected by this. but. I'm sure all of us know someone you know, who has lost a loved one or has lost someone themselves. So I think we are grieving together. Um, you know, we were thinking, I was trying to think about what this one million actually means. And I grew up in the US and all of us have grown up with sporting events. You know, and I think of football matches in the US or soccer matches and European football in Europe and those stadiums are huge. And they can fit 80,000 to 100,000 people. And if you think of 10 football stadiums full of people who've passed away, it's really sobering and it's, it's humbling. Um, and I think we just really need to make this push us even harder to work, to, to, to continue to work to prevent infections and save lives. And for me, there's so much that we can do. You hear Mike and I speak a lot uh, and the director general speak a lot about all of the things that we can do now. Um, and this just makes us work even harder. So, you know, there is hope uh, and there continues to be hope because we continue to see countries work incredibly hard to bring outbreaks under control, um, you know, for earlier clinical care for patients and, you know, and save lives. So this um, is, a, is a tragic milestone um, and it's not just another number. It's, it's a really important thing that, that drives us, makes us work even harder. Thank you, Maria. Any, any thoughts from you, Mike, on the way forward? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting, that million number, because it's a very resonant number um, for, um, as an Irish person, because um, the greatest tragedy in the history of our nation was the, the Great Famine of the 1840s, 1850s in Ireland, and it, it tore our country asunder, ripped our culture apart, caused the further departure of two, three, four million other people, and that's why you see the Irish diaspora about that one event that killed one million people. So it's interesting to me that the, the one million for the world uh, is horrific, um, and that one million that died in my country changed the course of our country's history forever. It entirely reshaped um, uh, Ireland, and a good part of the rest of the world through the influence the Irish had after. So good and bad came from that, some horrific things and some good things. And in that sense, we, I suppose, have choices now. We've suffered this great loss, as, as Maria has said, and, uh, and you can't compare this. Some people are comparing this to other things and saying, well, a million people died or something else. You can't compare this to anything else. A million people have died and their families are grieving, and this has disrupted and changed forever the lives of so many. Uh, but the mixed with that, uh, and we must be tinged with determination and hope that we can avoid the next million or we can uh, prevent uh, more deaths in the coming months. And there's a lot of work to do. So for me, it's 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 tremendously sad, but it's also a call to action. 
do we need to stand by and, and let another million people die? Or are we going to do something about that? Or, and, and what can we do? And what is possible? And it is the art of the possible now for us. But it is difficult, as I think we'll maybe just speak about this later. I think people are all finding, people are generally finding it very hard to sustain the effort to maintain and sustain all of this effort in terms of trying to avoid infection and trying to do the right thing. So I think that's a moment of reflection for us all, is to, is to recommit ourselves to fighting this virus and, 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 and in honour of those who have died, uh, but also to protect those who may die in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Maybe this is a moment as well to reflect on what we have learned in past nine months and um, while we lost some people, unfortunately, but also while we treated many people and while we also prevented many people from, from getting sick. Yeah, I mean, in the, the last nine months in terms of our advancement in science and our understanding of this virus is, is pretty remarkable um, in the sense that the entire global community has come together to better understand what this virus is, how it transmits, um, the disease and diseases that it causes in people, um, and what we can do to you know, prevent the virus from spreading, what we can do to prevent people from getting infected, from developing severe disease and from dying. And so this collective um, drive um, across academics, public health professionals, frontline workers, uh, people in different ministries and, and different countries all over the world have really come together to, to push um, the boundaries of what can be done in a 24-hour day. Um, there are so many people that have been working you know, incredible hours because we all have a common goal, is to understand this and to, and to end it. Um, but in terms of advancements on uh, you know, we know that there are things that can break trans chains of transmission. You know, we know how the virus spreads between people um, and the steps that are necessary to protect people. Um, the advancements on clinical care, um, making sure that people are detected earlier, that they are, they enter the clinical care pathway, they, they are triaged, um, assessed and triaged, you know, making sure that there's a, a clinical assessment to know what is needed for this patient. Um, early access to oxygen, um, early access, uh, you know, to to symptomatic care, and for severe patients and critical patients, um, it having dexamethasone. I mean, these all of these actions save lives, um, and so it's that knowledge that has been used to make guidance. It's that knowledge that has been used to create trainings. It's that knowledge that has been used to say what is the right personal protective equipment that needs to be purchased and procured and shipped. And it's WHO and our partners who have helped us to realize the use of science. Having science in a, in a paper, having science on a piece of paper is one thing, but really what we try to do with our partners is to turn the science into action because that's what saves lives. So there's been a tremendous amount that's been learned um, in the last nine months, and we continue to, to learn. So it doesn't end. You know, the science doesn't finish, um, and there's a lot of research questions that have been identified and prioritized, but those research questions will be answered, and then more questions will come up. So we continue to work, and that's the process that, that is, that is uh, science. Yeah, I think, um, and I, I really second what, uh, what Maria said, and I think, uh, while we may be all frustrated and all of us want to know more, um, in the past it's taken decades, years, months at the very least to have even a basic understanding of some diseases that have affected us. It took us years to understand HIV and AIDS. It took us years to work out what was causing AIDS. Um, it, it took us decades to work out what the hell was going on with Ebola, where was it coming from, what was causing it. Um, and we did better with SARS and, and MERS, but it still significant, took significant time. We have never in the history of science ever understood more about a virus and its interaction with human beings in such a short time and developed so many uh, ways to counter the virus and so many mechanisms and methods and, and now therapeutics and potentially vaccines and diagnostics and all of that. So we have to celebrate that as something we've learned. But I think we've also learned that science doesn't work without community. And you can have all the technology and all of the solutions that you like. Uh, 
but uh, and I think it's the same with all technology. Uh, if people don't use it, and if people don't believe in it, and if people uh, don't put it to good use, then it doesn't do anything. Technology and knowledge by itself has no inherent value unless it is put to use. And that is what we've all struggled to do. We've all struggled, governments have struggled to put that knowledge to the best use. Communities have struggled to fully understand and internalise what that means for them and their individual and community behaviour. Um, so I think that's where we're, we're learning too, that just the conversion of knowledge and science into effective action is not a straight line. No. Um, and we need to respect that and need to understand better how better to communicate with people on what protects and what's, uh, what's uh, uh, protects their health. But uh, in, in more general, what have I learned? I, and, and I suppose these are the principles that guide any endeavour in human society, be it as we face climate change, or we face social injustice, or we face racism, or we face that our planets, as we face. One of the things that I've learned in this event that are applicable to other things, uh, for us as a society, as a community, uh, unity, uh, empathy, solidarity, uh, empathy, resilience, commitment, staying power, uh, staying focused when you're being distracted from all sides. It's those simple qualities of human endeavour uh, and human uh, effort that are hardest to sustain at a, at a time like that. So yes, we learned the very specific sciencey things. Yes, that's great. Uh, sciencey stuff is good. But we're also learning more fundamentally about how our societies operate. Um, and and how we need to do better uh, at getting information and knowledge to our citizens and how that trust that should and must exist between government and science and communities is a really important uh, triangle and I think it's one we've taken for granted for too long and uh, we need to do better uh, so I've learned that. I think one of the challenges with this too is the duration of this event you know, and having this trust with communities and with with people and to maintain that over time as the situation mm. changes is really very difficult. Mm. You know, people are, getting frustrated. people are getting frustrated and and rightly so. I mean, we understand that ourselves, you know, and, and how we're dealing with this, but maintaining the momentum um, is something we need. It's something we have to earn, you know, from people because just telling somebody what to do is not the same as, you know, why is this important? What does this mean for you? And, and how can we enable, how can we support you in doing this? Or how can we work with you to make it fit for your family, for your community, for your safety? Um, and, and, uh, and that's a challenge, and that's a very difficult thing to do, and that requires individuals and families and religious groups and, and um, leadership, uh, you know, everything. Um, but the maintenance of this trust um, is very, very challenging. We take that very seriously. We try to communicate consistently, you know, of what needs to be done. Um, but communication of these complex measures are very difficult. We find often that people would like us to give a yes or a no, or a do this or don't do that. And a lot of the time when we give advice, it's contextualized. It's, well, in this type of situa situation, you could do this or this or this, or this and this and this. Um, and that doesn't make it a very short and concise message. Um, but it is complex. You know, all of this is incredibly complex. Um, otherwise, it would have been sorted, you know, very, very quickly. But people are very smart. Mike has said this a lot. People are smart. Um, you know, they need knowledge and information for action. Um, but again, we will work harder uh, and, and continue to work with different groups. You've heard us talk a lot about youth groups because so many different groups can play a role in this. But I do hope that everybody feels a sense of empowerment, that there are things that they can do themselves to protect themselves and protect their families. Thank you very much. We are receiving already a, a lot of questions from, from our viewers, and, and we thank them, and please keep them coming. Um, Maria, you are also, I mean, not also, you are an expert in infectious diseases and epidemiology, and I know you spoke about this a lot, but maybe it would be good to explain again um, are we going through a second wave of COVID-19 infections or uh, we are still in the first big one that is having different peaks? So the, the well, if we look at the world, it's very difficult to give a, a short answer to what's happening across the world. Um, the virus is still circulating. 
Um, we understand that about 10% of, of people have been exposed to this and have some evidence of infection. That means 90% haven't. And that means that the virus can, can, will continue to circulate if we allow it to. So many countries are, um, have experienced a peak, at least one peak so far. Um, some countries have avoided a first peak altogether. Um, but in some areas uh, that have gotten through their first peak and brought it under control, um, some are starting to see a resurgence or uh, an increase in case numbers. Um, and usually when we say wave, we think of a seasonal uh, virus, like influenza, where they have real seasons uh, and, and they increase in the winter months uh, in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. We don't see a seasonality in this virus yet. This virus circulates in all types of settings and climates and, and regions. Um, and what we are learning is that with the activities and the actions and interventions that are put in place, it could bring those peaks down uh, and it can bring the virus under control. Um, and in some countries, the circulation has started again um, because uh, restrictions are being eased and the virus can, f can find ways to take hold. It operates in clusters, so we're seeing outbreaks in a number of those countries. But the, the way that this virus behaves and the peaks that we see are in our hands. It is determined by what we do. It is determined by what governments are doing to bring it under control. So I think that's the other message that needs to be clear. This is a virus, this is a pandemic that is occurring, but it's happening among a virus that is controllable. It takes incredible hard work, um, but we have tools right now that can bring these outbreaks under control. Thank you very much, Maria. Dr. Mike, you're also a medical doctor. Um, can you maybe explain to our viewers how does COVID-19 impact our body, our immune system, if we are exposed and if we get infected? <coughs> well, um, um, we've all seen uh, the images, and those who've actually had the disease will know this, that uh, most people are infected through the, the respiratory route. Some the viruses uh, reaches the nasal mucosa or the, 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 the lining of your nose, to use a more term, or the lining of your, your, pa your airways or the lining of your lung itself. And that lining is all the way along. It's the epithelial lining of the lung um, and effectively the virus is adapted to uh, exploit that lining and the cells and, and for these linings are lined with human cells and effectively the virus comes along it's got a protein on the front like a spike and that spike is perfectly designed to match to and bond with um, an enzyme or a, um, on, the, on the surface of the cell and it's like a lock and key Essentially, the virus comes in and locks itself in. This, this enzyme is used for other things. The body uses it for many other functions. Mm -hmm. But this, this, it's sort of a back door. We, I mean, most people online will know with viruses, they often use these trap doors or back doors to get into the system. That's what the virus is doing. It's actually, it's almost like a Trojan horse. It comes along and it mimics a protein that the cell expects to see, and it binds and using that, it's able to gain entry into the cell. And the only reason the virus wants to gain entry into the cell is take control of the cell. Because the virus itself is not a living thing. It actually needs the, the factory of the human cell to make another copy of itself. It cannot do it itself. So all the virus actually has is this outer wall and these proteins, and inside it's got a packet of, of genetic material. And once it's inside the cell, it injects that package of material, and it instructs the cell to produce more copies of itself, and this eventually kills the cell. And what happens when the cell is killed, the cell breaks, and the body reacts. The immune system says something is going wrong. There are cells dying everywhere, and it mounts what is called an innate immune response, a, effectively an inflammatory response. The body reacts to the general um, alert. There's an intruder mm -hmm. present. So first of all, the virus is doing damage because it's causing cells to die. And then the immune response itself can cause some damage because it causes this inflammatory response. Uh, the body hasn't learned about the virus yet. The body doesn't know this virus, so it has this innate response. And eventually, over time, uh, in a normally healthy person or someone without an underlying condition, a battle ensues between the virus infecting cells and the body's capacity to fight the virus doing that. And somebody wins. And eventually, in most cases, the immune system wins. 
We fight off the virus. It doesn't do too much damage. You may feel sick, the lining of your, of you may feel a cough, you may have a sore chest, you may sneeze, because it's really disrupting the function of your respiratory system. But most of us get through that. What happens in some cases is that people's immune systems are compromised for some reason. They're not functioning as well. And their bodies don't react quickly enough, and the virus takes control before the, s the body system mm -hmm. can react. And that particularly worrying if it gets lower down in the lungs, because that's where you get your oxygen to your blood. And what can happen is it causes a swelling of the lining of the lungs, and that swelling can also uh, cross the lining of the lungs into the lining of the blood vessels. And when that happens, essentially, oxygen can't move between the air and your blood. And effectively, that's why people end up on oxygen, why they end up on ventilators, because your body loses the capacity to efficiently transfer. Remember, every moment of your life, when you're asleep, when you're awake, your lungs are transferring oxygen from the air into your blood, allowing your brain and every other part of your function to work. Anything that interferes with your efficient capacity to move oxygen from the air into your bloodstream is, is dangerous. And that's why this virus causes such severe symptoms. And that's why a, a, a good proportion of people admitted to hospital require what we call respiratory support. They either need to have extra oxygen or mechanical assistance in breathing. Um, and, that's a, and in addition to that, uh, if that's not bad enough, uh, the virus can also uh, have effects a long way away from the lungs uh, and it can actually have, uh, have uh, impacts on the kidneys, on the brain, on the gastrointestinal system. Some of that is because of the oxygen issue, because these organs like the brain and organs like the kidneys rely on that oxygen and if that's compromised, they can, those organs can fail. But also there's some evidence that the virus can also uh, affect the linings uh, of blood vessels all the way through the body and in some people that's a very severe effect. So some people don't, don't win the fight and they, they end up the virus overwhelms them. And in a small proportion of people as well, the immune system overreacts and we've seen a hyperimmune response. So basically the body overreacts to the threat and causes uh, an abnormal amount of inflammation which in itself can do damage. And we've seen that with some very small number of children who get this hyperimmune response. The child has a normal infection and then 10 days later has this very big inflammatory response and that actually has caused the death of, of some children. So our immune systems are strange things. They're kind of calibrated. They've got to react just right. They've got to do, they've got to do enough virus killing <laughs> to take the advantage over the virus but cause the least possible amount of inflammation uh, that was, can also damage the human body and it's a, it's, it's a balance and our bodies don't always get that balance right, especially if we're unhealthy, if we're undernourished, if we're compromised in some way. Uh, so therefore being healthy and having a good diet and being, being able to in a sense uh, absorb the challenge that a virus presents for a head cold or something that doesn't matter because the consequence of that might be, well if I'm not that healthy maybe I have the head cold for an extra day. But uh, in the case of COVID, this can become a life and death battle for an individual. So that's how the virus operates, how it gets in. It's a very simple process. Uh, but uh, it's amazing how such a small packet of genetic material has caused us such trouble. Um, anyway, I probably over-explained it now. I hope I haven't confused people. But uh, it is important for us to try and understand that we're in a dynamic balance with nature all the time. Uh, for example, if you were to take a swab in my nose now, you'll find bacteria. Some of them are pathogenic bacteria, um, and I could be infected by them, but, but my innate immune system is effectively always on alert. It's all, and, and, and all of these linings of my lungs and other places are constantly maintaining a balance. And we've heard that with, you know, when people are taking these drinks to try and manage their, uh, their gut biome. Well, there's a biome also in your respiratory tract, and there's a healthy biome. And there are healthy organisms that are in a dynamic sort of balance with your immune system. And that's an ecosystem. And what viruses do is they come in and they rip through that ecosystem because they've only got one thing in mind. That is to infect as many cells as they can infect and to force that cell to produce copies of themselves. For those people who are fans of, uh, of Star Trek, they're the, they're the Borg of the natural world, you know? <laughs> Thank you. This, this was a great explanation, <clears throat> and I don't think we've ever explained to our viewers how, how COVID actually and how the virus works and, and attacks our body. Um, I think it would be also good to reflect, I think two weeks ago you mentioned that 
we are we are seeing some changing changes in mortality and that we see higher rate of patients being uh, discharged with COVID. Um, so what do we we don't have a vaccine yet? Uh, we have one treatment um, so far for severe patients, but what are the ways? How do we treat patients when when they are in hospital and they were already sick with COVID? So half and half. Half and half. No, I, I was listening to Mike's answer, and I think a lot of uh, people are going into science based on that answer that he just gave. But I, I think this speaks to the fact that people are craving information and really want to know what is happening. Um, and and no, I'm 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 grateful. Uh, Mike answers questions like this because I think a lot of people really need that level of detail. Um, yeah, I mean, with regards to mortality, um, first part of your your question, we are seeing a reduction in mar mortality overall, and we look and. Um, on the one hand, like in the beginning of an, of an epidemic, in the beginning of any epidemic, normally surveillance focuses on severe patients because these are individuals who develop disease and they seek health care. And so in the beginning, when you don't know exactly who's infected or how widespread it is, you focus on people that show up at health care. As these outbreaks unfold and as they spread and surveillance systems catch up, and testing systems catch up, you're able to capture people on the more mild end of the spectrum, um, where there are contacts of confirmed cases. Confirmed cases tend to be more severe, and then the secondary cases, so this is after someone uh, who is severe infects somebody else, they tend to be more mild. We're picking up people on the mild end of the spectrum, but I do think that as much as we have learned, there is still so much we do not understand about this virus and the diseases, disease that it causes in people. And so while the majority of people who get this virus, who have disease, have a mild infection, um, many people have asymptomatic infection, meaning they don't develop symptoms at all. Um, we don't completely understand the long-term effects that some individuals have. And I think that requires us to say this often because some there is a feeling that, well, if I get it, it, it may be mild. And it may be. It may be mild and you may be sick for a week or two and then you may recover. But we are learning from some individuals they're having long-term effects, um, which is impacting the different organ systems and, you know, they're not able to um, walk and exercise and, you know, their shortness of breath and their extreme fatigue and we're seeing inflammation in the heart. And so there's a lot of things that we don't know yet. Um, and I think we need to remain humble about this um, because, as much as we know, there's still more that, that we don't. But in terms of mortality, indeed, it has been declining because um, we have people are being detected earlier, um, which means that they can receive clinical care earlier depending on their symptoms. Um, and for people who have mild disease, um, they don't have pneumonia, um, they're treated symptomatically. You know, if they have a fever, they're given medications for fever. Um, if they have a cough, if they have so over-the-counter type, type medications. Um, individuals that do require care, clinical care, admission to hospital, if they're identified earlier, that means they can have their oxygen saturation checked quickly. And that will determine, do they need oxygen? Do they need to have the oxygen tube that I'm sure people have seen um, in hospital? Do they need to be ventilated where they have actual support in helping them breathe? If that can happen earlier, people have a better outcome. They have a better outcome, a better chance of survival. We're also doing, uh, countries are doing a lot to prevent infections among vulnerable populations. Um, we know that people um, who are over the age of 60, uh, people of any age who have certain underlying conditions like chronic respiratory disease, chronic heart disease, obesity, diabetes, uh, immunosuppression, uh, cancer, um, people who have these uh, conditions are at a higher risk of developing severe disease if they're infected. So if we can prevent that from happening, we can prevent those severe disease and those individuals who would likely die. Um, and so if we can even prevent those infections in the first place, mortality will reduce. Um, so the, there are many positive things that are happening in terms of our ability to reduce mortality. Um, and so the CFR, the case fatality ratio, which is, a, which is a crude estimate of the number of deaths over the numbers of reported, um, is crude in that sense because we don't have a complete picture of, of, of all of those numbers. What we're looking at now is the infection fatality ratio, which is the number of deaths over the total number of infections. And the total number of infections right now are estimated, and they come through these studies that are being done, these seroprevalence studies that are being done, and through some modeling estimates, some statistical work. 
and the current um, estimate of the CFR is 0.6%, which may not sound like a lot, but 0.6% among uh, of a virus that has the potential to circulate um, if we don't stop it is is pretty high, and it's higher than influenza. And that IFR, that infection fatality ratio, increases dramatically with age. So, um, you know, on one hand, we're doing a much better job of actually driving down mortality. Um, we're doing more to bring transmission rates down. Um, our surveillance has improved, so we're actually able to capture people early. So I think there's a lot of factors that are really driving that down. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that's, that's great. I, I think in terms of the clinical treatment, we talk about treatments. Um, I think there are the three basic approaches that doctors and nurses and, 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 and paramedics and those are are, and nurse specialists are, <coughs> are trying to take. <coughs> one is, uh, and the one that's furthest away from us most of the time, is to kill the virus itself. It's always been tough to kill viruses. Um, not, you know, we've seen that you can kill viruses on surfaces with, with bleach and with products, but actually finding biologic products that people can actually take as drugs that target a virus is, is been, we've been brilliant on bacteria, antibiotics that everyone uses. Right? We're very good, although we're running out of antibiotics. So better, better be careful because we're actually losing a massively important tool for public health by misuse of those tools. But uh, having said that, <laughs> not to wag any fingers, um, it's been remarkably difficult to develop effective antivirals. Viruses are hard. Uh, to kill in that sense within a biologic system because they're 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 very small they're very simple and a lot of the material they have is very similar to ours because there there are their nucleic acid is able to interact with our system and instruct it so therefore it's very hard for us sometimes to recognize that as something different so uh, sometimes uh, it's hard not to end up targeting the person and separating targeting the virus well, I'll come back to that. We're making some progress. But most of our approach in treating viruses is not necessarily to stop the virus, but is to stop the virus killing the patient. And that means giving the patient the best possible chance of fighting back. And that comes from two things, supportive care. And that supportive care is really about managing, in this case, the respiratory support to maintain oxygen in the blood so that the person doesn't drop below a critical level of oxygen and also to manage the host response. Remember I spoke about this over-response, this inflammation response. And if that takes off, that can actually kill the patient too. So intensivists will look very, very closely at supporting the patient, their basic fluids, they'll support their level of oxygen, and you'll see the machines that go beep, 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 and you'll see these numbers that look at the amount of oxygen in the blood, and they watch that, and they watch for an event called desaturation. In other words, if someone drops off a cliff and, it, and that can happen very quickly and this is one of the things that doctors are learning it's not not all patients do that some patients get very sick and they just gradually get better some patients get very sick and they're quite sick and then all of a sudden they sort of go off a cliff edge and they call their oxygen levels drop really quickly and that's when the patient needs to be in the hospital that's when the patient needs the best possible care and it's really trying to, find, to manage the clinical pathways so we are picking out in the community those patients most likely to suffer, those patients who are most likely to jump into that really bad phase. And we're getting better at predicting that, we're getting better at recognizing those patients and getting them into the hospital environment and then when they do have those events it's much easier to treat them. Um, also drugs like dexamethasone, when someone's inflammatory response is too much uh, we've seen great success in using these anti-inflammatories that shut down that response, the host response, the inflammatory, just enough. And again, allowing the patient to get through. The patient is fighting the virus. And the great thing is our immune systems are fantastic things. They're incredible things when you think about it. That we're in this sea of viruses and bacteria and how we survive and get through it because our immune system is inherently able to cope with millions, hundreds of thousands of different and potentially infectious agents. Uh, it's incredible. Um, in terms of then the antivirals we talked about to kill the virus, uh, it's hard, and we do, we do have some. Uh, we currently have um, 
remdesivir and other drugs that are currently in trials, uh, drugs uh, that modulate the immune response like uh, dexamethasone. Um, and increasingly now we're seeing the beginning of results coming out of studies of monoclonal antibodies. And essentially what that is, uh, is that we've the company or researchers have taken the blood of survivors, small, not a huge amount of blood, and they isolate the specific antibodies that work against uh, COVID. And they've basically amplified and grown them up in the lab. So what effectively the approach is to give the person an immune boost by giving them a shot of really specific uh, antibodies, which is in a sense allows people who might not be developing enough antibody early in the swans. Remember I said it's a race, you're racing against time. So the idea being that if you can give someone an extra boost by giving them a kind of an, ass an assist uh, and giving them a shot of really specific antibodies that are, that are very specifically active against um, COVID, that you might get the person through that period, get them to a point where they begin to dominate the virus and the virus is not dominating their system. So. And that's why you know I'm amazed, and I'm so so, my, I'm in such admiration of the doctors and nurses in the front line, because they're having to do this in PPE, you know, they're eight hours of shifts, they're tired, there are loads of patients on ventilators, there's noise, they've got tons of stuff, they've got machines going beep, and there's things, and there's results coming from the lab, and in all of that, there's a human being. And they're trying to keep that human being alive. They're trying to give that person the best shot at surviving under a tremendous strain. And they're processing all of this knowledge. I'm really simplifying it, but they're having to do that in real time. It's easy for me to sit here and talk about it. It's a nice, gentle conversation. But imagine doing that in an intensive care unit, in, in that chaos, uh, and put cast your minds back to March and April in, in New York and in, in, in Italy and other places. These people are incredible because they have saved so many people, and we have lost so many people. Yes, but so many people have been saved by by just the sheer efforts of frontline doctors and nurses to help people. And we're getting better at it, and they're getting better at it. Um, and I think we will, over the coming months, have more specific antivirals. I think we will be even better at clinical management, and that is part of the explanation why we're seeing fewer deaths. Yeah. Thank you very much for this medical class, Dr. Mike Ryan. Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> And um, uh, we got a question from uh, Asraf uh, Dovla about antiviral drugs and if we, have, if, if we will have some soon. So I'm glad that you actually already answered the question without even knowing. Um, there are also, a um, question is coming about older people. Um, if they are safe, because we are facing now colder weather and if we go out, we go somewhere indoors and are people uh, older than 65 safe to go into indoor spaces if they are wearing a mask. And whilst talking about masks, there was another question as well. Uh, do we have studies showing the percentage of uh, masks protection from, from this virus? So thanks, Alex. Um, yes, with regards to older individuals, um, they, they're, what, what we recommend for individuals is to take this risk-based approach. We outline guidance of how to keep people safe. Um, for all people, we recommend to avoid crowded, enclosed settings, especially in settings where there's poor ventilation. Because in settings like that, if the virus is there, it can spread quite readily between people. Um, and we want to protect against that. So we can avoid those in the first place, make sure that we improve ventilation, wear masks if you can't. Um, you know, so there are steps. So if there's an individual who's over 60, they're at a higher risk of, of infection. So it depends on where you live. It depends on um, where you live and, and what the virus is like circulating around you. And what we're seeing countries do is that they are outlining guidance. Um, uh, many countries, they have very strong national plans, very clear national plans, but the implementation and the actions that they're recommending for individuals will be given at a local level. So either a proven, province level, a district level, a state level, a, a canton level, like where we live here in, in Switzerland, and those recommendations are based on what is actually happening in the community where you live. Um, but there are simple actions that all people can do. Um, and this is the hand hygiene, you know, washing your hands regularly, uh, using an alcohol-based rub, wearing a mask where you can't physical distance, avoid the closed settings, improve ventilation, um, uh, use respiratory etiquette. I'm forgetting some, but all of these different steps, everybody can do every day, regardless of where you live. Um, but there may be other uh, situations. Um, 
if there is an individual who's concerned about performing a certain activity, um, take ask some questions. You know, what is the activity itself? You know, do I need to do it? Do would I like to do it? Do I need to do it? Where is it being held? Is it being held indoors? Is it being held outdoors? Um, how many people are going to be there? And in that situation, can you have physical distancing or not? Um, will people be wearing masks? Can I wear a mask? What type of mask should I be wearing? Um, how long will it be? Will there be good vent? There's all of these types of questions that people need to start thinking about. This is part of our new normal. Um, and I think there's ways that we can make this easier so it's not a daunting task to leave your house. Um, but that's why there is guidance that's out there that's helping at that at that local at that local level, um, and I think that's important so people understand where they live. What are what am I being guided to do? What am I being advised to do, and keep up with that because that will change um, as the pandemic unfolds, as the situation unfolds. The advice will change or may change, and I think that's part of the fatigue. I think that's hard for some people when it, you know do something one day, don't do something another, and I think that's difficult a difficult message. Um, but with your question in regards to masks, masks are one of the tools that we have that help control transmission, that help the sp prevent the spread of transmission. Um, it's one of the tools. It's not the only tool. And so when you ask me about the percentage, um, there are some studies that are out there, some modeling studies that will make an estimate of how much a mask worked or how much physical distancing worked. What we can tell people is that you need to do it all. You need to practice your physical distancing. You need to do your hand hygiene. You need to practice your respiratory etiquette. You need to be well informed. You need to wear a mask. All of that helps. And each one of those things, you know, adds together to provide more protection and to help us control this outbreak. So there isn't a specific percentage. I'm sure there's a paper out there that does give a, per a specific percentage, but what I think is important for everyone is to understand that there are many tools that we can use and we need to do it all. Thank you, Maria. Mike, I think this is a follow-up question from previous uh, answer you had. Uh, do people who are not having COVID but are exposed to it are not affected due to their immunity? Can you repeat the question? So if people are uh, surround, there is a community transmission, this is how I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, they are exposed to COVID, but they don't get it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there due to their immunity? <coughs> Um, in, in this case, well, it depends, because in, in a few months' time, that may be exactly the case, that people who had COVID earlier in the year won't get it again because they've been protected by their immune system. But given that this was a novel virus over the last six months, let's take this. Number one, a group of individuals will have got exposed to the virus and will have become sick and have gone to hospital or not, right? And they know and they get tested. Then there's another group of people who, and many, many people out there who in the last six months will have had a fever or not felt well for a few days and may have had COVID, even though they were never diagnosed as COVID. And there are another group of people who will have probably not even noticed that they had anything wrong with them and they may have had COVID. So yes, exposure doesn't always lead to infection because there is a concept of the exposure dose. There is and for every disease it takes often years to work out what is the number, not one virus. One virus doesn't generally infect you. You need to have uh, either multiple exposures or a single large exposure to the virus by the appropriate route. I could probably put coronavirus on my skin till the cows come home, I won't be infected per se, right? But if I did that with Ebola, I might be. Uh, so it, each virus has a different way of entering, so the route of entry mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then the route of exposure the dose of the exposure, the duration of that exposure, and then the, the nature of the exposure itself. So, for example, if, uh, if there's respiratory droplets, it may just splash onto my face or go up my nose or I may touch my mouth and my hands and infect, auto-infect myself. If the, if the particles are somewhat smaller, I may actually inhale more of the, of the virus. Uh, so they're the kind of things that determine the risk of actually getting sick is the root and the dose of exposure. So therefore you're not guaranteed in being exposed to the virus that you will be infected. And the fact that you weren't infected doesn't mean you have a brilliant immune system. You're just bloody lucky, right? <laughs> uh, but if you are infected and you didn't notice, and you, then you go and get an antigen test, as you would try and out. And, um, you may find that you're positive and you never knew. And in that sense, you probably have a pretty good immune system because uh, it did the job. It did what it said on the tin, you know. Uh, so that's good. Um, 
But the one thing I will say is, and I think this is important for, for people, because there's a significant minority of people who get sick, even of young people, who do get significantly unwell. They don't go to hospital, but they are finding it mm -hmm. tough, and they're not recovering as quickly as we would like or they would like. And there are significant problems with their VO2s, with their ability to process oxygen. Remember what I said before, that the way that the virus really hurts you is that it impacts your ability to process oxygen because it inflames that lining, that, blood, uh, that, uh, that air blood barrier. And that's what happens. The blood diffuses across the barrier. So it comes in in the air, the oxygen diffuses across into your blood, and then it goes around the body. That barrier can become inflamed. And sometimes that inflammation doesn't go away for a long time, which means people are left, maybe they're fine to walk, they're fine to go to the office, but they find that when they exercise or when they exert themselves, that efficiency is lower. Now, some people spend years, and I see a lot of young people, teenagers, everyone really taking care of themselves and going out there and exercising, and spend a long time trying to achieve goals in terms of their physical health and their exercise tolerance. You can lose that in a few days with COVID. Uh, so, in that sense, for younger people out there, it's not just about dying or it's not just about being admitted to hospital. It's about avoiding this infection if you can, because in a significant minority of those individuals, and studies that have been done in Germany have shown prolonged cardiac effects, studies that have been done recently here in Switzerland have shown prolonged problems with oxygen transfer to the blood. And that's not to scare anyone, but please don't assume that this is a, not, a disease of no consequence. This disease has and does have consequences for younger people. Gladly they recover, but you have a long life to live, and you certainly don't want to live it uh, with compromised lung function. So I would advise that we all, just because we're not going to die from something, doesn't mean it doesn't matter if we get it, even for ourselves. Thank you. Alex, can oh, I say please. something? I'm sorry, I just want to add something to this because I think it's an important topic in terms of like why some people get infected and others don't. Mm -hmm. When we think about transmission and we think about how this virus spreads between people, we need to think about three things. And Mike outlined this. We need to think about how it transmits in terms of the mode of transmission, whether these droplets or aerosols or contaminated surfaces. There's other ways as well that we're, we're always looking at. Fecal oral, so um, you know, vertical transmission from mother to child. All of these different ways we are looking at um, when a person transmits in terms of the course of their infection. Do they transmit when they have symptoms, when they don't have symptoms? When are people most infectious? What we understand from that is people are most infectious, are likely to transmit to somebody else about two days before they develop symptoms, up to five to seven days after they develop symptoms. So that window of time is where people most of the time transmit to somebody else. And then where transmission is happening. And so this relates to some of the questions that you were asking about some of these enclosed settings. We know the virus needs close contact with people. Most transmission is happening between close contacts between people. Um, and then there can be these amplification events, these outbreaks. Um, and most of these are happening in what we call closed settings, where you have people in close proximity together, they have intense contact with each other, they have long duration where they spend time with, with individuals, they have high levels of exposure. So these are happening in these enclosed settings, they're happening, we've seen in nightclubs, we've seen in long-term living facilities, in healthcare facilities, in prisons. And so knowing how, when, and where transmission occurs tells us and everyone else there's different things that I can do to prevent that from happening. And I think that's what's really critical. And as WHO, um, we work with so many different disciplines to help us understand this. Because you can't just look at it from an epidemiologic point of view. You can't just look at it from a clinical point of view. You can't just look at it from virology and looking at the virus. You can't just look at it from an engineering or a physics point of view. All of that has to be brought together and you have to debate it and discuss it. And even today, you asked me about masks. We actually had a, a, our what we call our GDG, which is the Guidelines Development Group, to discuss, again, masks. And among that group, we have people who have disciplines of epidemiology and clinical management and IPC and aerobiology, um, you know, because we need to look at this from all angles. And this makes us stronger as an organization because we're pulling in all of these different disciplines. Um, and I think I just want to say this again because maybe people don't understand how we come up with our guidance. It isn't Mike and I sitting in a room saying, what do we think someone should do? There's a really, really robust process which 
um, is long typically, and it typically takes years to come out with guidance, particularly the clinical guidance. But we've sped that up to bring people together and have these teleconferences uh, where we discuss and we debate and we look at the published literature. Um, and that's something that is constantly under revision. So even masks, for example, you know, we even the GDG met today to discuss further uh, studies that are being published, um, not just clinical trials, but studies among lots of different different ways. And that is one thing I think WHO um, can do, that convening power of bringing people together and that process for turning the science that into we keep solutions. talking about into solutions. And we need solidarity to, to implement that, right? We, we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but also, I think th th this is something I think we've noticed too, all of us have seen. Uh, and this polarization, we've seen that at all levels, political all the way down. And w we cannot become so binary about things. You know, we, we, we have this arguments lockdown or open, open or closed, uh, government's responsibility versus individual responsibility, transmission is more important than mortality. Cases are more important than deaths. Or, de or uh, it's the economy versus the health system. Or it's containment versus mitigation. And we turn these things, unfortunately, into conflicts. Uh, it's, it's airborne transmission or it's aerosol transmission or it's drop. And these things turn into unfortunate battles of will, intellect, politics. That doesn't help anybody. Because, unfortunately, biology and life is not as straightforward as that. It's not either or. It's just more complex as, as we've been trying to explain. and risk management is not, there's no zero risk you can't guarantee that zero risk what you have to do is try and make the best possible decisions with the data you have to minimize risks the risk to the patient the risk of transmission the risk of misunderstanding it doesn't matter what those risks are uh, the risk of travel how do we get to a point where we take as much risk out of the process as we can so we can get on with our lives mm -hmm. and protect the ones we love and and there are as in that sense, there are no easy answers, uh, and there are no absolutes. And I think when we start talking about ans absolutes, it becomes very much like a doctrine. It becomes a dogma. And dogma is really dangerous in, in this endeavor. Uh, there are no dogmas. There is evidence, and we should stick to evidence, and we should go with the evidence, and then we should be open around developing and evolving that evidence. But we can't flip-flop between this and that, because people are getting confused. Uh, and science is at risk of confusing people uh, because scientific debate can be very complex, it can involve lots of different opinions, and it's really important that people have access to that process. But if the outcome of that is confusion as to what I should do, so it's not the argument around how does this bug transmit scientifically and from a biomedical point of view. The real issue is how do I protect myself? Where are the places in which transmission is likely to, go, to occur? Which are the high-risk environments? And what should I do to avoid or protect myself when I have to be in that environment? Mm -hmm. If I know that, then I don't have to worry about all of the complexities of the science and the engineering and, and everything else. What I need to know is if I'm going into a closed space, uh, and I have to be in there, then I want to try and maintain as much physical distance as I can. I want to get my mask on. I want to keep my hands clean. I want to ask them to open a bloody window. You know, whatever it is. And to take control of that risk management yourself. And then the, the people in that business need to be doing the same. And if you're doing it, and the people running a business are doing it, and then the government are doing it, and we're all doing that, then overall the risk levels drop. Uh, and it's not the government's job or the community's job, it's both. It's not the workplace's, the employer's job and the employee's job, it's both. It's not the youth's job and the older people's job, it's both. And, and I think we've become, it's very easy to shout at the other side, you're wrong, and you're wrong. you've got it wrong, and you don't understand. And, and, and I've seen too many of those battles in politics and in science and at societal level. And I think we're generating too much conflict. Uh, and we're not working towards a consensus around how we move forward together as a society across a range of things. And I think that's important for the next six to nine months because, as Maria said, everyone's getting tired, right? And the one thing you need when you're tired is certainty uh, and clarity because that allows you to operate under fatigue. When you're fatigued, all the bad things happen. Uh, but, but if you know what to do and it's simple, even when you're tired, you can do it. You know how to brush your teeth in the mornings. You know, no matter how tired you are, you know how to, you can get it done. You know, because it's there. It's 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 programmed, right? You give someone a complex task at seven o'clock in the morning, they're not going to do it. 
So you do what's in your muscle memory, you do what's practiced, you do what's simple and you do what's clear and you do what you understand as helpful and beneficial. And that's why you drag yourself out of bed in the morning and brush those teeth. <laughs> because no matter how time... <laughs> yes. uh, so I do think we, we in science have a responsibility to translate, not to simplify, not to dumb it down, but to translate and distill the essence of what people should do. Uh, and it shouldn't be for people to have to work it out and look at all those bloody sites. They can't agree on anything. What should I do? And I think a lot of people are genuinely getting frustrated with that. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe we'll have to do a poll. But I get a sense that people expect more right now from scientists. We, ha we, ha we do almost have no more time. There were several questions pending, so I'll pick two. One is, um, how can grandparents spend time with their grandchildren? Can they be outdoors, or they, if how if they are in indoor space, how we can manage that? I know we were uh, calling on everyone to to call their grandparents and uh, to pay attention. But if their grand grandkids are small, how they can interact? So that's a great question. Um, definitely call your grandparents, no matter where you live and in what situation you're in. Call your grandparents as much as you can. They're a treasure in our societies and um, please do that as often and as much as you can. Teach them how to use social media, not social media, um, different platform to call each other and be patient with your grandparents, I should say. Um, but it depends on where you live in terms of the physical interactions that people can have. Um, you know, grandparents are tend to be of, of older age, and we want to make sure that that they don't have exposure that's risky to them. I'm not talking about shielding, but I'm saying, you know, there needs to be this risk-based approach. In certain areas of the world, um, transmission is under control. Transmission is brought down to such a low level mm -hmm. that societies are opening up, mm -hmm. and grandparents and grandkids can they can be with their grandkids. Mm -hmm. And, and get those cuddles in. Um, and in some areas where transmission is intense, there may need to be some you know, restriction of, of, of contact at the, for the moment, for the time being. But I think you know, if we can collectively come together, you know, if we can do these steps as, as you know, we've been saying, not just at an individual level, but communities and governments and bring these outbreaks under control, then we can get people back together and in, in, into each other's arms again. Um, and, and the harder we work on this, and we're not trying to minimize the effort that this takes by everyone, um, as soon as we can bring these outbreaks under control, economies can open. The fastest way to economic recovery and recovery back into our, into our lives is to bring these outbreaks under control. And there's incredible progression on the development of therapeutics and vaccines, and that is wonderful. And uh, we haven't talked about that today, but you know, there's a huge effort that's really driving the acceleration of safe and effective vaccines and making sure that people have access to that. But even right now, before we have a vaccine, we have tools right now that work. And all of those tools will get kids with their grandparents again. Mm -hmm. So I think you know this. These are the things we we keep in our mind of like, what do we want? You know, what do we want as society? What do we want? Um, what is our drive? What drives us? What drives you? Um, and have that kind of propel you to take action. Um, and so we want. I, I mean, we live abroad. We live here, and my children haven't seen their grandparents in uh, ten months, and and they're just you know they FaceTime it almost every day. Um, but what they want is that cuddle. So the sooner that we can bring these outbreaks under control, the sooner we can get those those cuddles again. Yeah, and I think it's important that we don't see this as a one-way street. Uh, it is very isolating for older people, yes. and it's been very tough on them. And as such, we, we owe them that, that debt of honor to, to, to cherish them within our society. But grandparents are also hugely important in the lives of their grandkids. Mm -hmm. And their kids and they're contributing members of society. They're not people we just need to take care of and put in a, a gilded cage and protect and take care of them. We don't want to be put in that position. My mum was 80, she'd kill me if I tried that lot. You know? uh, so <laughs> so uh, from, from that perspective we have to recognise that the kids need the grandparents just as much as the grandparents need the kids and, and, and the parents need the grandparents <laughs> for, in the same way. So, and it is really, really important. And as Maria said, there are many places in the world the prize of getting this damn thing under control is to have those hugs and bring society back together in a way that's totally without risk. 
Um, but when there is intense community transmission and where we don't understand where the virus is uh, and where, you know, you don't know your risk and you don't know where that virus is, then one has to be extremely careful. But I've seen a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, you know, many countries, even in the midst of uh, a more restricted environment, still allow family groups to walk and go out together and go to the park. You may need to go to the park. Okay, you can't get the hugs in and mm -hmm. all of that, but, you know, we can get by without that as long as people spend time together. I've seen some really innovative solutions in terms of barriers <laughs> and various other things. It's incredible how innovative people are. The people I, I really, I really, it really hits me is because it's a double whammy, um, is people living in long-term care facilities and, and particularly people with m mental health uh, issues and uh, chronic and dementia and other things because these people are already deeply isolated and in a very difficult situation already and then they're further isolated uh, by COVID and uh, it's, uh, um, it's very, very tough. And time is a different factor. You know, it's amazing. You ask a young person what will you do in the next 10 years, and they, you know, they say, well, I don't know, maybe I'll decide in 20 years' time, right? Uh, an older person said to me once when I said I might see them in six months' time at Christmas, when I was home earlier this year, and they said, well, that's great, but you know, that could be half of the rest of my life. Uh, and I thought, wow, you know, so time is a different thing for people who are older um, and and that's the for me is the thing we need to we need to and again it's no there's no zero risk uh, the, the there is a risk to be taken um, and we need to minimize that risk and you'd ask before about is it safer with the mask of course it's safer with the mask of course it's safer if you wash your hands of course it's safer if you maintain that physical distance doesn't matter if you're 65 or six and a half right it's the same things apply the problem is not that and the likelihood of that person being infected doesn't go up or down. It's the consequence of the infection. And the consequence of an infection of COVID in an older person are vastly higher than in a younger person. And that's the problem. They're no more infectious or in likely to be infected. It's just that that consequence is much, much, much higher. So I would advise in areas of high community transmission right now, in parts of Europe and other places, where the disease is not under control, the people over 65 really, really have to think twice about putting themselves in situations where they may be exposed. Um, and that may involve limiting their contact even with extended members of their family. And again, uh, I know that's a tough message, uh, but I think it's one that has to be clear. Thank you both. Um I, I know from personal experience when I recently went to visit family that one of the hardest things was not to give my grandma a hug mm -hmm. who was running towards me and I was like, no, 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 you need to stay apart. So I hope that um, the message from the beginning of numerous lives that we lost is a wake-up call for us all to do it all so that we can go back to normal and that we can go back and give hugs to our grandparents and our loved ones. Um, and go back to our lives. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you all our viewers from around the world. I'm not going to list the countries. That it's, it's a huge list for watching us and for your questions. There are many that we haven't responded, but we'll be with you next Wednesday. Until then, please stay safe and follow our advice through our social media, through our website, or your, and your national uh, health authorities. Thank you.